You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. <laughs> What's your name anyway? Hey, kid, there's a big shot gangster. He's putting together a crew. You think everything sounds like a bad idea? If you come with me, you're in this life for good. I waited a long time for a shot like this. feeling about this. Hi everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Trance. Today as promised we are going all Star Wars and specifically we're doing Solo, a Star Wars story movie review. And this time around I have my wife and my son helping me put our thoughts together uh, after seeing the film. As usual, we are going to warn you guys, we're going to go spoiler heavy, super spoiler heavy on this one, and we're going to try to examine all the little tidbits, because this film seems to have the most amount of information in it that we've gotten in a long time that connects it to all of the other films we've seen so far. I'll tell you off the bat right now that I was very pleased with the film, but just like before, you know, if you guys remember last time I had to do multiple shows to kind of get a general consensus of how everybody was feeling about The Last Jedi. Here we have a different, I believe, reaction to it. So let's begin with Solo. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You're a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? The Force will be with you, always. Well, as promised, you know, we couldn't stay away from Star Wars too long as a subject. And I did warn you guys that we were going to hit Solo as soon as it came out. Normally, we wait a little longer for most other topics or movies because we kind of want to let it kind of settle there a little bit and breathe. But this is the type of movie, just like most of the other ones, Star Wars related, that we have to jump on it right away. Joining me today, I have Kyle and Kim, uh, both my son and my wife. My daughter was there too, but she prefer not to jump into this discussion. This is the second of the standalone films. It's unusual because we're developing this pattern now, uh, which maybe it's just coincidence and who the heck knows, but it seems that the more controversy behind the scenes that you have with these films, as opposed to the less controversy and the, the more positive feelings they seem to have while they're making it, the opposite reaction I seem to at least get on a lot of people as far as the turnout. You know, just like Rogue One, this film had a lot of reshoots take place and rewrites and a whole bunch of stuff that they rather not talk about. You know, it's it's very hard nowadays to get a, a behind the scenes detailed, you know, description of what's happening. You know, when we had the, the Rinsler books, obviously, you know, they came out. 30, 40 years later, 
but they were very detailed even though we were still getting a lucasfilm version of the story there was a lot of information there that you could kind of gather as to what the problems were in making a lot of these films but as soon as the force awakens came out and initially they had planned to do in a rinsler book about it they pulled the plug on that right away disney said or somebody said no 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 we can't really go into it even though I don't believe The Force Awakens had that much drama that was known ahead of time, you know, behind the scenes, other than Harrison Ford breaking his leg. You know, I don't think there was too much. But then, you know, with Rogue One, there was some drama behind the scenes and reshoots, and the trailer looked very different than the final outcome of what the film looked like, and the film ended up being great. The Last Jedi, everybody was gushing over how great it's going and how wonderful the new director is and how they love him so much that they're going to give him a whole new trilogy. And then the movie comes out and it kind of splits the fan base in half. So while that's going on, and even before that's going on, rumors are circulating that the solo film is in trouble because all of a sudden the directors they hired lord and miller who used to be from what was it a called? lego movie a lego movie and i think 21 jump street yeah so they have a comedy background more or less uh rumors started circulating that there was a problem with the shoot and all of a sudden they get fired and little by little we start to hear stories of them being more on the comedic side and them claiming that they wanted a comedy that you know they were hired to shoot a comedy which doesn't really hit me in that direction and lucasfilm saying no that they wanted a comedic touch to it so there's a rift between the two there are stories going around that they would encourage all the actors to improvise their lines and that Kathleen Kennedy and and Kasdan were upset about that because they wanted them to shoot the lines that were written for them. So they got to a point apparently where they would do it both ways. They would shoot it completely ad-libbed and then they would shoot it completely line by line. And then this way they could kind of keep them happy but then still shoot it the way they wanted. Uh, I believe the, the editor was also changed at some point because he, I guess the guy was editing to their style. And they also were not shooting enough coverage possibly on purpose this way when it comes to editing they can only cut it their way so whatever the story is the bottom line with this film is that they ended up getting booted uh, about three quarters of the way and they bring in a ringer or i wouldn't call ron howard a ringer no, but either. because he does have the chops you know you guys remember what his claim to fame was and let's go over some of those movies kim you you we were talking about these earlier what were his his older films that are super popular oh apollo 13 which i love right um willow which i i don't know how many people love but no, i loved it i don't think anybody i, enjoyed I it. think it was a bomb more or less but it was a lucasfilm project and he had like you said apollo 13 backdraft ransom in the 80s he had splash Cocoon, Gun Ho, you know, these are comedies, obviously, more more light-hearted uh, films. Parenthood, another kind of drama comedy. Uh, Far and Away, more of a action-y drama. Ed TV, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, A Beautiful Mind, that was a big one for Yeah, that him, was a good one. Which, you know, kind of started a collaboration, uh, not only with Russell Crowe, but with Paul Bettany. Then he did a series of Da Vinci Code-based movies that he just wrapped up you know kind of recently those are all his obviously if he didn't write that stuff it's from a from a book that's uh, very popular but then after that he kind of started doing films that w weren't really that popular i don't want to call them flops but they definitely were not you know top-notch kind of stuff uh, he did in the heart of the sea which kind of you know it's like okay next i think he did also a beatles documentary recently so he wasn't exactly you know on fire right now and like i said I, I i find it difficult to kind of call him a ringer because you know he does have experience in with lucasfilm but it was so long ago that it really barely matters there is a there's a note in wikipedia that he was actually offered phantom menace and he turned it down yeah. Yeah. which is like really i thought lucas was going to jump on that from supposedly the beginning he had, he had too much other stuff going on but, yeah and but i think that would have been i i would have liked to see uh, i don't know and 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 spielberg i think also was offered something with the prequels and he also turned it down and maybe that's what lucas said all right screw it i'm doing it my, all myself i don't want to mess around with other people but anyway so they bring in ron howard he has to to now reshoot a majority of the film. He finishes off a couple of weeks of shooting and then progresses to do a five-week reshoot on top of that. So 
more or less, this whole film has been reshot one way or the other. They even had to uh, remove a character, right? Because the guy couldn't do the reshoots. Right. Well, they didn't ben- remove the character. They just they yeah. removed yeah. Yeah. Paul Well, the actor, it was they- Paul Bentney's character, who's the big baddie here, Dryden Voss, originally was played by Michael White, if you guys remember him from The Wire and Boardwalk Empire. He's the African-American actor who has this big scar down his face. But apparently he was also supposed to be a motion capture yeah it was like a lion creature yeah, yeah something weird so i'm like oh you know he's got a very characteristic face and and he's usually plays baddies but they were going to completely substitute him anyway so that's unusual so he couldn't return and that's how they got paul bettany to come in which i guess might have been the connection with with ron howard since he's done a few films with him before so you know the movie also had some rumors going around that you know the the lead actor who, I mean, this is a very difficult role for any actor because they're going to get criticized no matter what. Alden Endrich, there were rumors that he was getting like acting coaches to that's come and help him. That's what scared and it's me. Like, huh? I was so, so down on this movie and I needed this movie to be the best out of all the the singles. Well, we only had two so far, so I, I Well, no, but I all the that. ones that have come in, all the ones that this is the one that was going to mean the most to me. And I was so disappointed when I was hearing all these rumors. And I, honestly, I was like, why did they get this guy? He, he's just, he should look younger. I was just totally down on him as playing Han Solo. Well, then the trailer started coming out little by little, teaser, trailer, trailer, you know, that sort of thing. And I, you know, I started feeling good about it. You know, I had my my doubts and I was, again, with my theory of, you know, after The Last Jedi, which was a very big disappointment for me, you know, and this could have been the follow-up that completely could sink this franchise because they are very frequent now you know people are talking about star wars fatigue and are just like marvel fatigue are we getting too many too fast you know could this be another super crazy creative last jedi type of turn now the thing that works in this film as far as i'm concerned is that it does have a comedic touch i understand that and i get it and i think it works for this film because it is a standalone kind of film The thing that, again, and I keep thinking, this is what happened with Thor. Thor went from a pretty serious, fantastical film to the third one being more or less a comedic film. And it works. Where it shouldn't work, it works. Here, you have the same scenario. These are Star Wars films, but these are Star Wars films that can afford something different. Because they're not necessarily tied to a trilogy that's surrounding them and, and feeding off of them. The Last Jedi, again, because we're coming off Force Awakens, I had too many problems with because of that. But for a standalone film, you know, I can see that. And I can also see how the problems with the directors, the directors probably wanted to go more comedic. You know, make it would it have even been funnier. way too much. This yeah. was a nice balance. Right. And that's the thing that I also complained in The Last Jedi was that I, I get the humor and I understand that there is some humor that works for a typical trilogy. But then you go overboard with the humor and it feels weird. Here they kind of put the brake on it at a certain point and they, you know, they throw you the jokes and don't get me wrong, this thing is full of all kinds of jokey, funny material. But wow, what a difference it would have made if they would have gone even a little farther with it. Let's go over the actual story because we're dealing with, I guess, this is a, uh, this is an origin story, I guess, if you want to call it similar to Marvel. Let's see, Han is running scams in Corellia and he has a kind of like a girlfriend and they're trying to buy their way out. What do you mean kind of like a girlfriend? That was his girlfriend. Well, they were his in love. They were going to run away he and escape together. He obviously didn't know her that well. Oh, he did. No, because oh, I have a, my, my I theory is that she didn't change. I think she might have been using him from the beginning Ooh, just to get through really? this portion of her life. Oh, I didn't get that. So they, they, they're they running a, 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 some kind of scam where they're going to hopefully pay off somebody and they're going to sneak away and something like that. And in the process of getting away, she is not able to get away, but he is. But he unfortunately has to join the Empire in order to be able to get away as a recruit, you know, because he wants to learn how to fly or whatever, but ends up being basically just a foot soldier. And he wants to get out of that. And then he there hooks up with some criminal guys that are running scam, bigger scams, bigger, bigger, uh, uh, bigger missions that they're trying to, you know, score. You know, this is all for smuggling. money. This is not uh, smuggling. Yeah, they're smugglers. They're, they're criminals, which is the whole background of, of the whole solo storyline. So we go through an entire mission 
that it seems to be going pretty well and he kind of is able to manage his way into it and he even befriends Chewbacca in the process and that was adorable yeah they they do a, <laughs> they do a slightly different take on what we all thought the exact canon was and then at the last second the mission falls apart because another gang gets in the way and the shipment is lost and now all of a sudden they owe the big boss a lot of money because they lost this shipment that they stole so we end up getting a secondary mission and this is where they hook up with lando because they need a fast ship and that's the way that lando works his way into the story and and they meet each other and that gets you to the basically the second half of the film where you have another mission and Overall, and especially towards the middle and later end of the film, the film starts to turn into more of a Western. You get the feel of the whole Western motif, the locations, the actions, the, how you set up your characters, the double crossing that takes place left and right, all the way up to the end where in a typical Western, you know, the bad guy, the, the clean Eastwood type of character, sighs with the the peasants you know he he that whatever treasure it is that they stole he turns it over to the peasants where here you have a similar situation where they're going to give this this loot this uh, fuel really because it's worth so many credits over to the peasants that are in a way we, you know you thought there were other criminals there but they end up being the beginning of the rebellion also a different branch of the rebellion uh, and that kind of splits him with just about everybody else that he's involved with other than Chewbacca and to a certain extent Lando, you know, his his so-called girlfriend, you know, tries to double cross him. The boss tries to double cross him. His mentor double cross. Everybody double crosses everybody at this point. And that's where we end up with at the end of the film. So let's start talking about a little bit of not necessarily specific Easter eggs, but different things that are happening in the movie. As usual, we're going to go spoiler heavy here. We always do. But let's start off with the big surprise cameo, if you want to call it. Kyle, why don't you tell us uh, who we see at the end of the film, which is the person behind the person behind, you know, it's the the, the bad guy behind the bad guy behind the bad guy scenario. Darth Maul. How does he play a role in this? From where we like remember, basically, he did survive Phantom Menace. Why? How? His ability with the dark side of the force was so strong that he... Because of his and his anger with Kenobi, basically just drove him to survive all that time. But but where do we see this? Where can people find this information? Because well, it's not in the yeah, film. In the Clone Wars is when he the first bring show. him back. Yeah. So you watch the Clone Wars, and then he shows up again in Rebels too. But eventually, he actually he gets killed by by Obi Wan Kenobi. But in between that time, like the Clone Wars, he starts building this like criminal empire with all these different guilds, and he loses it. But then he starts getting it back again. And at this point in Solo, he's in control of, he's like the silent leader of Crimson Dawn. Like nobody really knows except for apparently Dryden and um, Kira. And, Kira. Yeah. and now, and uh, Dryden was the original figurehead of Crimson Dawn, but, he, but Maul was always the leader. And everybody just like, oh, uh, Voss is the leader, I guess, because they didn't know about Maul. And now, now Kira is in charge now, and Maul says that, and he tells her to go back to Dathomir to meet him. So I guess that's where his base of operations is. And we we do see it in Rebels a little bit. It's just like this cave, mm-hmm. basically. But it's very interesting that I, I was not expecting them to put Darth Maul in here. Yeah, I thought that at the end we were going to get a more traditional Star Wars villain. Let's say, for example, yeah. a Jabba yeah, or, or even Boba an emperor. Yeah. You know, somebody that's usually behind the scenes. Yeah. Which, But what, what surprises me the most about this is that I was always under the impression that Disney wanted to get away from the prequels or the non-OT material as much as possible because they wanted people to focus on the original trilogies to tie them specifically to the new movies, to the new trilogies. But the fact that they are going to throw Darth Maul here says to me that maybe not. Maybe they do want to capitalize on all this material that's been put out, especially with Rebels and Clone Wars. Yeah, They they need to. If Disney is smart, and there are times I question whether they understand the fan base as well as they should. Lucasfilm understood it. It's why they gave everybody, I'm not everybody, but they gave people rights to use material and stuff, people like podcasts and shows, because they understood that the the fans were their lifeblood. And Disney knows this, but I don't know if they understand the complete psychology but that's of the, the, that's the marketing, Star Wars fan. That's the marketing yes, but, element but of Lucasfilm. But what Lucas I'm saying Film. is maybe they realized that they, they can't just keep 
Darth Maul or the prequels completely out of the picture. Because while there are people that, you know, the prequels are, are, are a big conflict. So there are people that, that like them, people that love them, people that hate them. And, but they need, they need to, they need to keep some form of canon, even though they ditched it, they have to cater to hardcore fans that know the history. Well, even Lucas, I, I'm, I remember clearly that, you know, he would whenever he would have any criticisms of why did you do this or why did you do that? It would always come back to, well, it's my story. I do whatever I want. I made him for myself, not for the fans, which is fine, which is which which is true. And that's the way he did it. However, with with that said, you know, there's always the the Boba Fett was wasted argument that that chased Lucas forever, where he was then able to bring him back as the father of Boba Fett with Jango Fett so kind of make up for it a little bit. Yeah, and then in the Clone Wars they brought Boba Fett yeah, back. Yeah, they as, brought them both they, back they, in. They showed how he progressed and Right. And became, and yeah. and also he had the same problem with Darth Maul because people said, again, you introduced this really cool character and after 10 minutes of fighting, that's theoretically the end we see of him, but they did bring him, you know, through the back door with Clone Wars and yeah. Rebels to give you more of that character that people seem to be very curious about. So it's a, it's kind of like a two-handed scenario here where on one hand you're saying I'm sticking to my guns, but on the other hand you're saying there's money to be made here. We better do something about it and give people something yeah. to the, chew on. Exactly. The fact that they did Darth Maul just opens up so many doors for like just other cameos. Well, like, Well, the, not only yeah. the cameos, but it reinforces the entire Clone War series. Yeah. And, and it, it really throws all that into the... I know that they were considering it to be canon to a certain extent. And when Lucas was in charge, he had these different levels of canon. And yeah. you had the films, yeah. and then you had the TV shows. There were tears. But yeah. now, by throwing that character in, you're on yeah. equal footing, pretty well, much. Clone Wars was always canon. But, like, I mean, obviously, the a lot of the comics and stuff, before all the comics pretty much before, a fun fact, all the comics before the Disney purchase, except for the Darth Maul Dathomir comic, was considered not canon anymore. But the Darth Maul Dathomir comic, which takes place right after we last see him in Clone Wars, that was still canon. And they re they repackaged it as a Marvel comic too to help enforce that, that it's still canon. Well, what you're doing at this point now is you're forcing uh, film viewers to engage in what I would consider to be EU-ish kind of material now. You're forcing people to go in that direction a little bit. And I th I think that this that the way that they did that, I think is going to help. But, I mean, there's other factors with other issues that are going to well, attract people. Well, it'd be interesting but, if this is going to go yeah. somewhere. In other words, yeah. were th was this just a bone that they threw at the super fans to, to kind of, you know, give them a, a rattle? Or is this something that will lead somewhere where you will encounter, granted, you know, there's a good chance, you know, we've been hearing the re the reports. We have a Boba Fett movie most likely coming. Yeah. We have an Obi-Wan movie. Is it possible that they, these characters will kind of work their way into these other yeah. future films? Not necessarily as the stars, but as little background characters that will pop in and out. Remember, Edwidge has a three-picture deal here yeah. that could go in either direction. He could have a pretty big role, which we probably won't. But he can just be a guest star on these films, like they do with the MCU, with yeah. with uh, Tony Stark showing but, up. At, but you uh, also have to remember, though, Felicity Jones also had a two picture deal, but obviously she got taken out. But but uh, she could show she up. She could still show up if if in they something. do something. Yeah, yeah. They could, in, a, in like either she's, one of these she's alive during Solo. Yeah, she because this show takes up. place ten years Th before there Rogue could be One. A, yeah. uh, a prison scene, and she's in prison or yeah. something. You know, or, or, or yeah. Well, something. she'd be like. 15 in this you know. i yeah can i just say something about I'm, i would love to see alden come up in some of these other movies and i can't believe that i'm saying that because you know how i was i was oh, so yeah. down even when the trailers were out i thought the film itself was looking good i was happy to see that it looked good but i still wasn't happy with his dialogue the tiny little snippets that we got so I was about, what was it, two weeks before the movie came out, I was uh, reading the, um, I follow, uh, if anyone knows Savannah Kiefer, the dorky diva, she has a podcast, she has a blog, huge, huge Han Solo fan, as I am, and she was at the premiere, and she was not too thrilled with episode eight, 
So, you know, she doesn't just love everything Star Wars that comes her way. Um, when she said that she loved this film and she gave so much props to it, I knew it was going to be okay. I trusted it. And oh my gosh, she was right. It was fantastic. So I formally take back everything bad I've said about the actors, the, the everything. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's dig a little into the characters, you know, as I continue to go through this list of specific things. Let's start with Han Solo. What do we think of him? I mean, you just told us exactly what you think. What did you think? Yeah, I th- I thought he was great, honestly. Like I, I feel like um, and I know I know you did too, mom. But in the trailers, they kind of showed his his weakest lines, and I'm sure some of them were like alternate yeah, they takes. They must have. They must. So have. it wasn't. Yeah. It's still like I was. I was. It was getting better for me, but it still was like it still felt weird. But like after like five minutes of into the movie i was i i immediately yep. took him in as han yeah. solo he yeah. he really portrayed well especially in those beginning scenes the i guess young boy i still don't quite understand how old he's supposed to be at that point but i suggest 25. late teens early 20s well, he, uh, early he's 20s. supposed to be um i'm trying to think because he's 35 in a new hope yeah this is about oh, 10 okay. years and before. so, yeah. and so, it, all right, so, so the, like, the major okay. part of the movie is about 10 years before so yeah he's 25 a, and then, a young guy struggling yeah. to live struggling to stay alive struggling against the circumstances he's under, I really enjoyed watching his naive ways being stripped away throughout the film. And I think that was portrayed quite well. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. I mean, I remember you, for example, telling me, you know, that there are other actors out there that they could do great impressions of Mm -hmm. Han Solo and it's Han Solo. And I think not only in the Solo character, but in the Lando character, there are times where an actor can do a little bit, a little taste of, of, of a line or an inflection of how you say a word or something like that, that captures that that imitation. But you can't do 100% imitation because then it's like, a, it's like, it's like comedians doing Shatner yeah. uh, impressions. It's funny, but it's distractingly funny and unusual to watch just a 100% impression from beginning to end. You never get to know the character. You're only channeling somebody who's not there in front of you, and it's distracting. So I see why it doesn't work that way. I think he did it pretty well. I would even give more credit to Lando as him doing an even better impression without it being an impression. Maybe it's the costume, maybe it's the lines, but with Han, he has to be laid back, he has to be calm, he has to be reckless and always looking for the next scam in this film. Granted, by the time we get to Star Wars, he's a little more calm about it, he's a little more in control, here he's a little wilder, and like you said, he is more idealistic and he's going to do these things and he has these plans. By the time we get to Star Wars, he's just plugging holes because he owes this guy money <laughs> and he's got to get this because he's got to get that done he his life is practically over in terms of planning he's just doing damage control by the time we we meet him in star and, wars and uh, i was talking to somebody the other day um it was, it was that waiter right he was saying i think that he he talked uh, i really liked him but i i think he talked a little fast han solo talks a little slower and i'm thinking no that's that's maturity that's you know the, the man's a bit tired by a new hope he's he's more mature he's more he's more cool cool and and calculated with what he says and with what he does right and he's, he's a younger pro- he's here more of a and, professional and, now yeah. his job is to be a criminal that's his job he's he's a he's a pirate he's you know he's all those things that he's not yet at this point he's like a young guy trying to join a gang and he's trying to impress everyone with all the bs he can come up with in this movie and it can't be easy for him because as kira said in the movie his his real nature is good it's right. goodness. And and I still think and I like <laughs> I said why be- I love him. <laughs> like I said before, I still think that I don't think she just changed as uh, in those 3 years her personality completely changed. I think she was in a way using him more or less in the beginning. Granted they were maybe boyfriend girlfriend whatever you want to call it, but it just intensified as things got worse. So she became more of what she already was. I think in the in the film like I think after the three years had gone by, I think everything she did, I think she had something in her heart for him, but I think 
from the time they reunited to the end, she always knew how it would end, how how she would, you know, everything was yeah. very calculated for her. But I really thought that in the very beginning of the film that they were this couple in love. More of a I blank really, slate. I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't get that. I just think too much changed for her in three years. While he was struggling just to get back to her during that time, she was just struggling probably to stay alive. And I guess that, that can change a person, I would think. Now, what did we think of Lando? I thought he was probably the best, like, portrayed, honestly, out of everybody. Donald Glover did an amazing job. I think he did a really amazing job because the truth is I hate Lando Calrissian. I always have, and I still do. So he did a really good job. <laughs> Again, yeah, I, I agree with both of you. As far as who, who did the best job with their character, yeah, I think it is him because he gives them so much more of that slimy used car salesman feel uh, yeah. to to he's constantly cheating he's constantly but he it's it's like he has the bare amount enough to be a good guy just barely to that point and also you know with with lando there's a lot of props in terms of the, the way he dresses the way he keeps the falcon there were so many things in the falcon that are so lando-ish oh who didn't want to try on all those capes well Oh, I did. There's a lot of capes, and obviously they make fun of it, you know, as they should, because he is was the first guy, I think, to wear all these capes in the movies. But, uh, you know, again, he did a great job. And the way that they figured out the, the cheating, the fact that it wasn't just one game. You know, we watch the trailers and you think, okay, boom, there's the game, there he wins. No, he doesn't win the Falcon until all the way in the end, where he kind of reverses the cheating that Lando did to him in the first place in order to win it this time around. Plus, we also got that insight between Lando and his robot that I know some people are freaking out about and how that robot is also incorporated now into the actual Falcon. That's which cool. We're, we're going to hit that, too. Now, let, let's talk about the... Well, ch there's nothing really to say about Chewbacca. Chewbacca is Chewbacca no matter how you slice it. The canon of Chewbacca is pretty much, I would say, 75% there. You know, he meets Han Solo, and Han Solo frees him from some kind of enslavement. Originally, we thought something about him being enslaved and he owes Han a life debt and no, he they... leaves his family to go with Han because of this debt but that was all I don't know EU canon yeah, or they, something yeah well we, we don't see lumpy and stumpy or whatever oh. <laughs> but um I mean, and the, and they don't mention the life debt I mean right. maybe maybe they'll mention it later or like Chewie mentions it, but they, we, we don't know because we, there's no subtitles sometimes. Yeah, who knows? Him, I don't know. know. But um, but we do get a scene where there he is frees a, a whole bunch of other Wookiees. But in, in Clone Wars, don't we get uh, yeah, Ahsoka the, freeing Chewbacca also from another yeah, imprisonment? From, from, yeah, but yeah, this is obviously... This or something? is obviously before episode three, but... But yeah, he get oh, okay. Chewbacca gets stuck with uh, with, with uh, uh, as a slave and yeah, uh, okay. traditions. But also, we see in in Rebels they go to Kessel. Obviously, this is maybe five years after this movie, but they go to Kessel and they free a bunch of Wookies at, at Kessel. But uh, Chewbacca is not there, right? So, but you do get a little bit of that, and like I said, he does get to rescue other Wookies that are being enslaved. So you kind of get the background yeah. of that. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the the bad guy slash questionables. We talked about Amelia Clark's character, Kira, how she's questionable. What about uh, Woody Harrelson's uh, character Beckett, which is the Han Solo's mentor that that tells them outright that sooner or later everybody's going to betray you. Obviously, even himself, you know, even yeah. he's going to betray. So you have to walk into this movie knowing that everybody can just completely betray everybody. He makes me incredibly uncomfortable with that, which I think was the point. And I it takes a while for him to accept them because he turns them down and and beats them a couple of times before, you know, while he was in the uh, military. Because yeah. he's kind of like a, he is military, but he's pretending to be military. Uh, he yeah. stole a uniform or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that he's just you you always had in the back of your mind he's gonna he's gonna do something he's gonna turn on him but then there's these scenes where he's kind of talking to him almost like with fatherly advice yeah so the dichotomy of that the that fatherly figure and yet you had a feeling that he was going to betray him and then he did anyway is he's just very uncomfortable and his um, his gang you have a couple of interesting characters you have uh, the girl that is 
kind of like his girlfriend, yeah. which we don't really find out too much about her. She's like another badass uh, gang member of you know of the of that crew that eventually you know she's out of the picture fast. He did seem to be affected by her death, though. Yeah, and he yeah. was def- he definitely apparently had plans, you know, future plans. Those two together, but. It's almost kind of like it's part of the business, you know. Yeah. It's he's got you got to move on. And because... after that, he probably really just didn't right. care anymore. And, about but there anything. was another guy <laughs> played by John Favreau, right? His voice and yeah. was it mocap? I don't know if it was. Yeah, mo-cap. it was a little mocap. Yeah, it was, and um... he was a cute little character, a forearm character who always saying like interesting, yeah, funny I, things. He was basically Rocket Raccoon. That's yeah, kinda yeah, like, yeah, 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 pretty much. That's what I kind of thought. Uh, now about uh, now, now let's talk about Paul Benty's character. He's like okay, he's the bad guy behind. The crew, let's say, he's the middle bad guy, mm-hmm. but he's kind of the biggie in this film, the one we talked about earlier that it was replaced by a different actor. He's like the rich gangster, let's say. You know, we get the scenes where he visits his lair and he's got all these luxurious items and he's making the next deal that they're going to do. And, you know, they failed at the first one, but now they propose a second deal, you know, to go steal all that uh, fuel that they lost in the first one. He was all right. He had this thing where his. Well, again, unusual. Originally, this was supposed to be a, a CGI character, but now when they yeah. introduced the new actor, they said, screw the CGI, let's just do it with his face. But they gave him like these weird scars yeah. that I could have swore whenever he would get enraged, they would turn red, red, I, red. I didn't notice that. I think maybe it was because any time he was like really angry, he yeah. had those knives. And yeah, those are like, mm. uh, like lightsaber knives or something. It's weird how they did those things. But, um, but I honestly, like, I think that those scars might have something to do with Darth Maul, maybe. And we'll get, like, a tie-in comic or something, maybe. Or something. I don't know. But, um... He's he's eerie. He's just... He's just eerie and unabashedly unapologetic over how he goes from one moment being, yeah, are you okay? How you doing? You know, and, and you know, straight into, you know, if, if you don't do what I need you to do, you're dead, you know? Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's very like, creepy. It's, it's, it's so like blatant. It's like a high-end gangster thing where yeah. they can be completely civil and and I've always and, found that and, creepy though. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh high class yeah. but then they throw the psychotic in between sentences. Yes. You know, that's that's that the has always creeped playing. me out. Never in everything like that. Um, now let me hit a couple of things here because I, I definitely want to talk about this. There's so many callbacks in this film to everything just about everything Star Wars that's ever been done before I almost feel like this film was done in the opposite manner that most of the other Lucas directed films were done in terms of they gave the fans so many shout outs to just about so many aspects of of canon and almost canon stuff for example the disguise that they wear when they infiltrate the mining colony Beckett's disguise is Lando's disguise from Jedi. <laughs> How it's great his was helmet. that? It's yeah. part of the chest plate. So I guess it's part of it, that thing is just living in the in the Falcon, waiting to be used. <laughs> yeah. In Drayden his boss's office, few people have pointed out, and I did see some of this, not all of it. There's lots of Easter eggs in there. Apparently, you have from the Indiana Jones films, the fertility idol, the stones from Temple of Doom, the Holy Grail from Last Crusade. There is a giant crystal skull that you could say is from Crystal Skull, or it's the from the cover of the Han Solo novels, the old, old, original Han Solo novels. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, stuff like that. Did you guys notice any of those? I didn't. I mean, I noticed I, the skull. But, I when yeah. he was, um, I was kind of fixated on him during those scenes because um, he really creeped me out. It, it is kind <laughs> of distracting in a way for the super fans, I think, because. And this happens to me every time I watch a Star Wars movie now is I am picking at the details and I'm not concentrating too much on the story or the lines because I am like hunting for stuff, for information. I don't want to miss anything. And, and unfortunately, this is the type of thing you got to watch a few times because either you for, you miss something from the movie or you miss something that was in the background. You also have in the office a Mandalorian armor that at first people were thinking it's a Boba Fett cameo, but it wasn't. No, yeah. I, I think it's more of like an ancient mandalorian one because it looks like like the helmet looks similar to like the ones that we've seen but in, it's in red. rebels they were red yeah. but but they the body armor itself is like more like a samurai rather than mm. like mandal than the mandalorian armor we've seen before so i think it's it's like pre- it's a pretty old edition of the armor there's also a character in there that shows up that i remember seeing 
in a visual dictionary for Rogue One, and I, I Kyle said that he, you actually saw it in the in the background. It's these yeah. these people that have kind of like half the head, yeah. and according to the mythology, is that it's Doctor Ebizon who's experiment. That's his claim to fame. That's why he's a yeah. criminal. He experiments because he takes like slaves and removes half their cranium yeah. in order to make them more subservient to whoever it is that uh, owns them. Yeah. And they do this weird effect where I guess they must do like a, a green or a blue cap and you literally are missing half that person's head, which is really creepy looking. Yeah. Well, that there is a character like that in, in his office. Let's see. When Chewbacca is playing with Beckett, uh, the hollow chess, there is apparently more creatures, more characters than there was in New Hope. I thought so. And the reason was that because, now the, the real reason is because historically, when they build the hollow chess thing, they had, I believe they said they had 12 creatures, you know, that they were going to animate in stop motion. But Lucas, for some reason, said, you know what, only give me 10. So there were two creatures that were never used. Those two creatures, they called them uh, Bulbous and Scrim, they gave them actual names <laughs> to them. Well, when they were kind of ramping things up to do it all over again, they realized they found these extra creatures and they realized they forgot to put them, you know, they, they couldn't put them in the first time. So they actually have them now in the hollow chest. And when Chewbacca gets angry and bangs on the table, those two little creatures disappear. So that means that he <laughs> broke the game thereby not getting those extra creatures See, down the line. This is the stuff that the hardcore fans need. This is this yeah. is catered to. To us, of right. all and, ages, the hardcore fans. And it's the type of thing that, yes, Lucas probably wouldn't have bothered with because it was an artistic decision in this first place not to include those creatures, but to throw it here, it kind of helps. Uh, Clint Howard, who's Ron Howard's brother, always gets a cameo. He got one here. He's one of the robot fighting slave masters or something. Yeah. Uh, and he gets uh, beat up uh, during that thing. Uh, Bosk is mentioned as a possible hire. Yes. Yeah. So that fun. that's interesting. And I actually read something about that. If they do any sort of continuation, they want to bring Bosk on as a character at some point. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because they were saying like, you know, he's trying to convince them to hire them. And, and, and she's like, you know, why don't we hire Bosk? He's yeah. a, you know, much I, better. I hope that like if they when they do that Boba Fett movie, I hope it's like it's another heist movie, but they have Boba Fett teaming up with these other bounty hunters and Han yeah. Solo is in there too with yeah. Chewbacca. You can give him a small role. You can have a small yeah. role. There's no problem. The, the famous I love you, I know line gets a, a weird twist here because by the end of the movie, Lando says to Han, you know, I, I hate you. And he says, I know, which everybody <laughs> understood what the twist yeah. there was. There was a correction in the movie itself that it seems to be happening since Empire came out. And that is uh, Lando keeps referring to Han as Han. That was great. And he does it on purpose just to piss him off. Yeah. And Han <laughs> says, no, it's actually Han. Yeah. And, and it's like you but can tell. Just- Keeps two. going with it. Yeah, yeah they, they're just messing with each other. <laughs> At the end, when the are actually playing for the Falcon this time for real, and Han win- wins, this is when. He hugs Lando the same way that Lando hugs him at Empire when they first meet him. Yeah. Yep. And the thing that takes place at that point is that Han actually removes, I guess, that card yes. that he's yeah. got that device under his sleeve to, to so he couldn't cheat. Right. So then he could cheat against him. And that's how that takes place. Yeah, well, the, you know, what in in Empire they're they're exchanging that hug again, and even though something wasn't literally Lando didn't take something from Han, he knew all along he had Vader waiting in the Well, wings. he had something up his sleeve. So yeah. I hate Lando Calarissi. <laughs> <laughs> There's tons of musical cues here that are throwbacks obviously to the original trilogy the john yeah. williams score granted this wasn't john williams this was john powell which again to tell you the truth i have not had a memorable star wars score in a long time i mean i couldn't tell you an original cut from this movie music wise i couldn't tell you an original one from from last jedi i couldn't tell you an original one from rogue one from Force Awakens, there's Ray's theme, which was written by John Williams. The whole soundtrack the, is John Williams. And then the First nice. Order and yeah. Resistance themes, I think. But I, these but, latest yeah, ones, is... I couldn't tell you. I could only pick out the classic stuff when they would pop in. But yes. it was done in a very weird way that I really don't enjoy. And that is, they have regular music, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of whatever regular music, you know, original new music, they throw you a couple of beats of a more recognized theme. But, and it's yeah. kind of like... I understand they're trying to make us think of that, but 
it's just abrupt. It's kind of like holding a flag saying, look over here, look over here. I don't, I don't I, like that. I could see that where it would be abrupt, but I can tell you that one of the highlights for me was when Han and Chewie were suddenly in the seats of the Millennium Falcon together for the first time, and they had the Star Wars, the original yeah. theme going through. That I appreciated very much. And well, I we enjoyed. heard the uh, the Imperial March when, as part of the recruiting video they were showing. Yeah. In that recruiting <laughs> video, by the way, we get to see the the ship that is the Cantwell ship that I've been talking about in the past, and mm-hmm. I'm going to have a show about it very yeah. soon, that uh, was reduced. Apparently, it was supposed to have a bigger scene, I guess, but it was reduced basically to a hologram yeah. of this old uh, conceptual ship. Yeah, and that Imperial uh, March thing, it's actually the same. It's it's meant to be more of a march. It's a recruitment and, and um, it's march. And it's the, same, it's the same song that they use in Rebels, in Rebels. during one of the parades. That's yeah. right. I do remember they did that. It's the same uh, one. I did hear the asteroid chase music during some of the flying sequences the tie fighter attack sequences yeah. i did we also heard uh, a little bit of duel of fates when we saw maul at the end yeah so they they I do throw that. those yeah they do throw those left and right scarif is mentioned as a planet that they don't want to go to because yeah, it's too difficult to oh, steal yeah. from so that's interesting because that's a rogue one reference Beckett mentions that he killed Aura Singh. Now, why yeah. don't you tell us what that's well, all about? Yeah, Aura Singh is a bounty hunter. You see her briefly in episode one, just yeah. like looking at the pod race. But, but she's then, really more from... But, yeah, and then in Clone Wars, though, you see her like actively like being a bounty she's hunter. She's been in a couple of and episodes. And she, like, she was like a mentor for Boba Fett at one point, And she's fought like Ahsoka and Anakin and them. Um, but And then now we find her... I found out her fate, basically, that, that or, Beckett kills her. Or at least he thinks he did. Point. Who knows? Something like that. And then... Beckett mentions that when he like retires, he wants to go to Gleansom, which is actually the planet that Kit Fisto's race is from. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see. There is an eventual duel between Han and Beckett. And the way that the duel is staged is that Han already has a blaster in his hand and he's surprising Beckett. And Beckett does not have a blaster in his hand. He has it in his uh, uh, holster. So as they're kind of talking to each other, you know it's coming. There's a duel coming between these two. Mm -hmm. And then as Beckett reaches for his blaster and we stay, the camera stays with Beckett. Mm -hmm. We see him get shot two times in the chest or one time in the chest, something like that. We never see Han shooting, but we do get the impression here that obviously Han is shooting first before Mm -hmm. the other guy even gets a chance to to get a shot at him. And that is a very uh, diplomatic, I guess, way of letting everybody know that Han will always shoot first no matter what, (laughs) which is kind of, I guess it's a subtle, you know, sorry, George. You know, we we understand that you mean well, but we're we're still sticking to the original. Well, you know, the man sold. I had his back for everything he did before he sold because it was his baby, but he sold. Yeah. So, all bets are off. As we learn in, in A New Hope, Chewie does tend to rip people's arms out of their sockets. And in one of the fights, he yes, actually does that. He, he ends up and he's like, he's like, he's holding these two arms. He yeah. doesn't know what to do with them. He's yeah. like, what happened? Yeah. Uh, there is a mention from Lando when, when they're first, I guess, approaching or about to go to the, the, the mining colony. He's like, oh, I hate mining colonies, which is very ironic because later on he's going to be running a mining colony. Yeah. Yeah. And you actually, apparently, you can see a little model of Cloud City in, the, in his... In he, the and the ship. Falcon. Apparently, yeah. not only the, the Cloud City, but there is a tiny falcon, they say, there yeah. too, which is, I guess it's supposed to be a background decoration that is not supposed to be that because obviously you're not supposed to be able to see it. That's yeah. a little silly. But it's kind of like, <laughs> I guess it was a super hidden Easter egg. Yeah. Kira's character apparently is supposed to know this fighting technique called Terrace Kasi. Yeah, it's it's from the martial art. Yeah, there's a PlayStation game. It's like a Star Wars fighting game that came out in like right. 2001 or so. It's, it's a it's a it's a yeah. it's a it's a yeah. it's a bone thrown in that direction. But yeah. apparently, it's also the fighting style of the Praetorian Guards in Last Jedi. Oh, really? I didn't. Know That's that. another one they're saying. So it's I like, liked cool. it. I liked it. So it's Despite like that's interesting. Fact. Despite the fact that I don't like her very much, <laughs> I, I did like that. Warwick Davis, uh, once again, has a cameo like he does in every one. This time around, he actually has a couple of lines. But what's ironic or interesting is the fact that he's playing the same character, right? Yeah, from episode one, there he's uh, spectating the pod race. Right, he was like yeah. in this... I think he might have been in the same uh, booth that either Jabba or Gartula the Hutt, one yeah, of those two were in. I think so. We also see tooth tubes from Rogue One, at least one of those brothers or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think maybe that this is him like getting to that point where he's going to work for Saw Gerrera eventually because he's already a, 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 in a rebellion. You know? Now, I'm still, 
I'm still looking. We I have to see it again. Yeah, but I'm, yes. I'm still looking and I'm trying to find pictures. And I know it's too early. People haven't gone frame by frame. I could have swore I saw a background character around that gang that looked a lot like Saw Gerrera. He was an African-American guy. He had the he had the fro and he had the mustache and he had a lot of uh, gear on his body. Yeah, I don't, but he was in the background. I don't think that it would have been him because otherwise it would have, first of all, it would have been Forrest Whitaker because... Because like that scene takes place around the same time as the original flashback scene from Rogue One at the beginning, you know. So I feel like if it was him, he would have been there. Number one and number two, he would have been like in charge. Well, that's the thing that 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 that's that's the best argument that I could hear is that he would have been in charge, maybe. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if they do have him as a background character and they purpose. Obviously, you can't afford to get him because he's too expensive just as a for a cameo purposes. But yeah. you could have a lookalike in the background, slightly out of focus. Yeah, I don't think just that's so it's same. technically there. We'll see. I mean, we're gonna find out more stuff as as the weeks go along now yeah. of stuff that we haven't even. Even noticed yet but i'm sure we're going to get a lot more speaking of cameos anthony daniels apparently had a cameo and i missed that i, I missed it him. too originally people were thinking he was going to play obviously c-3po because that's what he always does but no it's not c-3po then they thought that maybe he's going to play a wookie because this way he can be <laughs> with with chewbacca and some shit no it's not a wookie he apparently plays one of those prisoners in the mind that's it's a humanish prisoner that is talking to the other wookies to kind of encourage them to rebel just like the other ones are rebelling when yeah. everything starts to go crazy he's one of the ones that is part of that gang apparently we did mention uh, john Favreau plays rio durant that four-armed guy which was a sweet little character that has a pretty bad death that we kind of unusually care sad. about it yeah. was a yes, sad death yeah he's a cool he was, dude yeah and he does mention something about how if you know when he gets back home or oh you should try minoc stew or something like that yeah. which again it's a minoc it's a throwback to empire during the the time where Han is joining uh, the Empire, he doesn't seem to have a last name that at least he's willing to give. <laughs> and the the recruiter kind of he you know he's like oh you're by yourself uh, well you'll be Han Solo we'll call you Han Solo. It's like okay fine that's kind of like a it's your traditional Ellis Island story of uh, you know Giuseppe what's his face comes <laughs> yeah. in and they can't pronounce his last name so they're like okay you're Giuseppe uh, Queens here you go congratulations <laughs> Giuseppe Queens. <laughs> Uh, the whole issue of the parsecs, the 12 parsecs. Well, we kind of knew a little bit of this before, that parsecs is not a time. But that's old news. It's, it's not it, a time it's, frame. It's a distance frame. And the and the, the trick to this is that it would traditionally take, from what I've been reading, yeah, something like 18 to 20 parsecs to make it out. But because he ends up taking that shortcut by triggering all these other you know, impossible things to happen. He's able to do it in a lot of distance. And it's also even questionable if it's 12 because at the end he yeah. says, I round down to 12. So yeah. it probably wasn't even 12. It's probably a little more than that, but yeah. it's, it's a little game going on there with that. Yeah. The droid that Lando has, which again is a little questionable in terms of some people are having, you know, they're getting their panties in a bunch. They did something different with this droid, and this is something that they haven't done yet with droids. And this is something that, it, amusingly enough, I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone the other day. We did a show a long time ago, a GeekFest Ranch show, about droids. We did like an hour or two just about droids. And the subject of slavery and droids came up in our conversation in that the fact that droids do seem to be in the Star Wars universe, as far as back as Lucas, they seem to be a second-class tier kind of citizens where... They're only there to serve. They're not even allowed to come in the bar with you. Yeah. <laughs> then people have bad feel. Like even Han Solo, he's like, you know, he hates them. He just despises droids. So there's this ongoing thing going on with droids. Here they took this particular droid and it was voiced by an actress and it was very boisterous in terms of it wanting almost like independence and, and droid rights, if you will. So there's a little social context taking place here. They invade this uh, mining colony and all of a sudden this droid's like, okay, well, I'm going to start freeing these droids now. And he yeah. starts talking all of them <laughs> and they start going crazy. And I love the gonk droids that they're, because they're, they're forcing them to fight like like a gladiator pit type of thing with droids. Well, no, this was a, that was a different part of the, 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 the movie. Wasn't that in the uh, that was when they were when, stealing the 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 gasoline? The, no, the fuel? no, that was that was when they first met Lando. Yeah, that was a when different... they first met Lando. Yeah, he was, was in oh, that okay. place that I, I guess Cantina style. Well, the droid is called L E E T, 
And the 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 reason they named it that the, the the funny reason is because it's a reference to an alphabet that has to do with the internet where you take letters and numbers and form words. It's called the Leet Alphabet. So if you guys want to look that up, you can do that. Uh, but I've, that's I've the heard whole of that. I think I think I've heard yeah, of that. Yeah, where you can take numbers and form words and letters, and oh, it's kind of like okay. a license plate mm-hmm. where you t- take these and you can form these words out of out of combination of numbers and and uh, letters. But this is a droid that it's a little different because at one point they're talking about how you know she the droid has a moment with Kira where they're talking about men, for example, and they're saying you know he, you know he's he, you know I know you've been watching him and I can tell you're interested in Han and whatever, and then she's like, what about you and Lando? And she's like, oh well, you know they they, they start to talk about how. She does seem to have some sort of relationship with Lando. Oh, but yeah, but she's saying it's all him. She's, but she doesn't sound like. But she, she sounds, sounds like, like you know she likes him, but she's not going to admit it. Right, but, but it's but, she, but it's that it's, he likes it's her. a little weird at one point, yeah. and then later in the film she gets hurt and she gets killed, and Lando freaks out. He really yeah. he practically breaks down, and they have to he has to carry whatever's left of the body of the robot in the ship and they have to help him out because it's almost like he can't even move his body himself. I, I actually did feel a little bad for Lando at that point. <laughs> I'm not totally callous. And- the other gang that ruins the initial plans of stealing all that fuel that then shows up a second time, the leader of the gang is called Enfy's Nest and the, the rest of the gang they're referred to as the Cloud Riders. That's a name that's yeah. been used before, I think in comics or something. It comes from somewhere. Yeah, it's from the old, old Marvel comics. It was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the, the twist with that gang is that by the end of the film, they encounter them again and they're about to steal everything again from them. And we then find out that, no, this gang is apparently what could be considered the beginning of a rebel cell. Yeah. Uh, they're about, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to fight for the rights of the people that are being uh, robbed left and right. They don't really mention the Empire that much. No, because it was it's the, more it was about the everybody Dawn. stealing from each yeah, other, the all the gangsters and the, and the pirates. Yeah. So she, you know, this person takes off the helmet. And you're expecting like some kind of weird, disgusting creature to come out. And it's, it's a girl. And it's like, wait a minute. What the hell is this? So that's a pretty big surprise to have. That happened, you know, at the last minute. And again, that's more like the traditional Western where that's when Han decides, oh, crap, I guess I got to help these people now because it's the right thing to do. Again, going back to the whole thing about him not wanting to do the right thing, but he can't help it sometimes. Because he's good. Deep down in his heart, he's good. <laughs> the planet where they're fighting with the army when he's uh, training as a, as, a, as, a, as a foot soldier, it's Minban, which is also uh, from Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Another throwback, you know, another throwback to, uh, to uh, the earlier stuff. The gangster that we see in the beginning, that's a, kind of like a caterpillar looking thing coming out of the water, the voice is by Linda Hunt, who you might be more familiar with her. I think she was in uh, NCIS, uh, The Year of Living Dangerously, a long time ago. So she's, uh, I guess she's a voice actress now also as, 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 far as, uh, as far as we know. When Han is challenging Lando for his first card game, uh, he puts up his ship that he doesn't own and doesn't even have. And the model of that ship is interesting because it brings us to Rebels, right, Kyle? Yes. Uh, they mentioned, uh, what was it, the YT freighter? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's the same model as the Ghost. So not that he's aware of the Ghost, but I guess that's a known model of ship, which is a derivative, I think, of, of the Falcon. Yeah. It's it, another yeah, it came model. Before, yeah, Yeah. There's another cameo of a character that maybe, Kyle, you can help me with because I'm not very familiar with called Tam Posla. And he's apparently one that showed up in Rogue One and is in the Dr. Alpha comics. Oh, the... the the, with blue, the helmet. With the and blue the, helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in the background in the first Lando Gamble thing, yeah. So there's just about a ton of... And, and this is only from the first... Uh, you know, this is only after seeing the film two days ago all the information that's out there now of all these connections that are just about all over the place. What about those whales, Kyle? Because I could have swore those whales are part of something having to do with... Okay, so first of all, we don't see those whales in the movie. Now, hold on. Let's let people know what we're talking about. When they're doing the castle run, as part of the the shortcut, they enter the section that is unsafe. And in that unsafe section, you have like all these almost like black holes that are opening up and these yeah. these 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 kind of like octopus whale things with spikes yeah, it, and it's, teeth it's not a it's not 
It's are those the same, same that we it, saw on Rebels? No, it, it's not. It's a completely different creature, but it, it has the same like feeding process where they, they eat there's the fuel. Cre- yeah, there's, yeah, there's creatures that they'll they'll live in these gas clouds and they'll eat things. Like like in Clone Wars, they had these um like you know from uh, Camino the those little winged creatures. Yes. Yeah, they have things like bigger versions of those that hide in nebulas and they yes. eat the, neb- we've, the and we've seen those. Gases. We've seen those yeah. too. But um but yeah, it's the same feeding process but it's not the same creature definitely not well speaking of creatures that are wing creatures when we were looking at the capes in lando's uh, cape room if you will Mm -hmm. there was one cape that kind of stuck out and it would look like a hawaiian shirt and then later in the film is what he's wearing well i found out yeah you got to look it up the pictures on those is it's these winged whale kind of things that was a Macquarie concept drawing oh, from uh, cool. from Empire, <laughs> and they just kind of duplicated them into a shirt because they wanted to make like kind of like a loud shirt yeah. with a lot of stuff on it that looked unusual. Yeah. And that's what he's wearing at the end. Yeah. This very loud also, shirt. Also, also at the end when they they pan into that jungle planet where. They oh are. yeah. Yeah. That that actual pan was reused from the original original teaser trailer for Rogue One that was screened at like at one of the celebrations. And it's it's impossible. Yeah. I'm still looking for it. I can't find yeah. it. It's on YouTube, but it's it's a leaked thing. It's like shot with a camera. Yeah. Because they never officially released now, it. Now why wouldn't they do that? The movie's so cool. out, the movie's like been out. Basically that trailer, it's it's panning up and then you see the Death the Star. The Death Star. But and obviously they don't have the Death Star there. And in it's the like, day. And it's like Obi Wan quoting the Death Star basically is what oh, he's okay. doing. Well like that's the voiceover you hear while it pans up and you and you see those little winged creatures too Ugh. yeah well it's funny because in this movie it looks like you're in a forest but it's just some plants next to the tables where they're playing yeah so it's a tr- they're, they're, yeah but it's, playing it's a the trick exact on same it's the exact same shot it's yeah. just colored a little bit differently like it's a little brighter another weird thing i've heard is that there's a coffee maker in the falcon that is exactly yeah. the same one from what i understand that they used an alien yeah. inside the Nostromo because they wanted all this futuristic looking hardware for people to use and he has it in the same manner and I yeah. think they reused it even for Back to the Future it's part yeah. of the flux capacitor yeah, he has like yeah. a whole he has a whole yeah. little like bar area yeah he's there. yeah. He, yeah there's a lot I wish that's the thing I can't wait to start seeing the, the, the books uh, all these books where they're going to show you all the uh, the sets because there's so much modern looking stuff in that Falcon yeah. I mean by the time Lando gets away that ship is a mess. It's been <laughs> clobbered. It's it's leaning yeah. forward. It looks like it's been practically half of it smashed. <laughs> well, <flat. laughs> the 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 guns are first of all single cannons. Yeah. Uh, and and they're and one of them is broken. Han will later turn it into quads. The yeah. dish that sits just flat on top was also sheared off, like it's been in just about every other film. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's in pieces, and and very prominent in this film, you have the dice, the dice that were a, a super minor thing in, in a New Hope. They showed up for a second, just as a, as a goof, really. Uh, yeah. But later, with the more modern films, they kind of reintroduced them, especially in Last Jedi. They re- reintroduced the dice, and you definitely see them prominently here when he's riding on his yes. uh, on his land speeder. He's putting the dice there first, and they're his. And and I think he gives them to her, and he gives them back to her, something like that uh, during this movie. And they're also prominently displayed on our mic stands. Yes, well, I'm looking <laughs> at them right now, and they're they're pretty they're, they're pretty cool. heavy looking. Yeah. And they're golden dice. Maybe yeah. they're loaded dice. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> but I I don't know. I, I get the it. feeling that overall everybody here at least was pretty happy with it it's a definite good follow-up to last jedi <laughs> I, I honestly i like this one better than rogue one honestly in my opinion i think i i don't know maybe i'll have to watch it again but right now i'm sticking with rogue one as as my favorite of the two this one is not like the bad one this is no this is just another good one but rogue yeah one, the thing i like about rogue one is the fact that i'm dealing with characters that i don't know their fate and I don't have any preconceptions of them, and I don't know where they're going. Yeah. They're either all going to die, or maybe some would live. Now, granted, we know they all died. <laughs> but ironically, in the earlier scripts, it was shot that they didn't all die. But then they changed it because of the, the whole reshoots that they did. Yeah. Uh, and the end of Rogue One gave you a massive infusion of geeky, nerdy things that that nerds like us want to see yeah. Darth Vader fighting in the uh, rebel transport. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. not going to lie though. I was kind of like hoping that like maybe the end would be 
like Jabba shows up with like in a, in a ship, and Boba Fett just runs in and kills everybody from the Crimson Dawn or something. You never know. That's, that's what I was well, kind of hoping. That's why I was kept saying happen. that I, it wouldn't surprise me if at the end instead of Darth Maul it would have been Jabba because okay, it ties more to so, but hey, whatever, that's fine. But what I'm saying is. For Rogue One, they, they took... It's kind of like saying you take all the Easter eggs we just talked about and in Rogue One, they threw them all in the last five minutes. They gave you a, a, an overload of, of Easter egg-y kind of, you know, geeky, nerdy stuff mm-hmm. right at the end. Uh, so I do like that, you know, the, the structure of that. Now, granted, I, once we see this film a couple more times and, and go over it with a fine-tooth comb like, like we end up doing, looking at the art of books and, and, and the visual dictionaries, reading the novel and, and just getting more, you know, mining for more data, you never know. It might, it might move up a notch, but definitely better than Last Jedi as far yes. as I'm concerned. Unfortunately, now we have to wait a year and a half, I yeah, think it is. Yeah, uh, because episode nine comes out in right in December, and I'm not sure year. where they're going next with the single film. Is it is it is it Boba Fett or is it Obi Wan? Because yeah, it's one of those two. That's even though we've been like, hearing yeah. definite signs that they're doing these two films, I have not yet seen official yeah. Lucasfilm, you know, emails or announcements yeah, they, that say this is the na- this is what we're doing and this is what it's going to be. Yeah, period. Based on like the news that's been coming out from just like these other sources, because Lucasfilm hasn't really concretely said anything. That's what I'm saying. It's it's always it's only been the Hollywood Reporter, Hollywood Reporter that's been doing which this is stuff. Like, granted the Hollywood Reporter is not like you know. It's not like Bob's podcast or or Geek Fest Rant saying yeah. rumor has it that blah blah blah. No, Who cares what rumor has it? Generally, they right. generally Hollywood have... Reporter is like saying the New York Times is alleging that you yeah. know for 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 but, Hollywood. But yeah, it sounds like Boba Fett is in further along per- production just because they have the director and yeah. they have um, Simon Kingberg as the writer. Right. And Obi Wan, we don't know anything other than the fact that they wanted to start production next year. Right, and obviously, uh, Ewan McGregor has been making the rounds because he keeps saying, "Hey, I'll do it yeah. if you want me," yeah. I, and he keeps showing up at premieres and stuff. Yeah, so I, I want him to do it. it. I, I, I would, hope. I would be I, disappointed if they didn't have. No, he has him. to because yeah. he can do it. He's, yeah. we, we're and familiar he's with his too, face. You know, I'm can, looking yeah. forward to Obi Wan much more than I'm looking forward to Boba Fett. And in these films, like I said before, here's where you can take <laughs> people with multiple contracts, yeah. like a Han Solo like Jin Erso, and throw them in, not as the stars, but give them a third of the movie or a quarter of the movie where they have to somehow in the story interact with your lead story characters. Yeah. So there is plenty. Plus we have the, the animated show now and the live action show now. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike. So So qu- quickly, what was your, what did you appreciate most, the single most thing that you appreciated with Solo? I really did appreciate the way that they executed Lando. But Darth Maul really, like, just, that was nuts. Because that just, for me, that just gives me this idea that, like, okay, if they could put Darth Maul in here like this, they could they could throw Rex into a movie at some point. They could throw Ahsoka. Ahsoka. They could definitely show, throw Ahsoka in there. If they could yeah. do this with Maul, they could do Ahsoka very easily. Especially Disney. I mean, granted, yeah. Disney is more concerned about marketing and revenue and reaching as many people as humanly possible in terms of diversity they will want the character that the little kids are just that they just lost. If there's a chance to bring that character back in a movie, they're I can guarantee they're going to do it. Yeah, I appreciated the fact that Solo was well thought out, or at least came off as if it was really well this, thought out, which is yeah. what concerns me about the trilogy movies. Because even though I I did love Force Awakens, I didn't dislike. The Last Jedi, as much as you there, there I have a lot of problems with it. Me um, too. But, and, yeah. but my biggest problem overall is that they just seem to be handing the whole package over to the directors to make all these choices. And my question is keeps being, where's the story team? Well, keep in mind. Why aren't they saying in, this is what happens? Keep in mind and that then, even though they do hand over to these directors, and sometimes to me it seems like it's insane, there have been times now where they pull them away from the directors. Right. Solo well, lost yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, Colin, was it, what was Colin, that guy? Uh, Colin Treveau, yeah. Treveau, he was he do lost episode the episode nine. He was just... supposed to do nine. He's out the window. It's, so they they pulled yeah. them back when they thought they haven't had it. But with that said, how could Last Jedi take place if you have those, yeah. those safety it's, nets? Here's, but, here's it, the it, difference I've noticed between Last Jedi and like Han Solo is the script. Like Last Jedi, they wrote that script within a year. And... But with 
with uh, Han But they Solo. also said they also said here, take this script, do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah that's like, the yeah. problem. You can't do that. You, you need some story team. Yeah. For you need a some reason. focus. Yeah. And I, with, I trust Pablo Hidalgo, but I don't know what the heck. Where was he in this all of this? Or maybe that's the problem. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the, he wasn't. Maybe I, it was their know. fault. I don't know. But yeah. like with Solo, Lawrence Kasdan's been writing this movie like before the Disney purchase. Lucas had him start working on on one. He said, "I well, just I, I think it was just for kicks, but." He's been working on this movie since like 2009 or something. It's probably. just a very careful balance to keep between gaining new fans, keeping mm-hmm. the fans who are just like, I just enjoy this and keeping the hardcore fans. I mean, it's, it's a big job to keep all those people satisfied. And I can appreciate that. And Rogue um, One was the same deal too, but with, with, uh, with like script writing, he, he was writing. The, well, John Knoll. Yeah, John, it. John Knoll pitched it like the second and right after the Disney purchase. Yeah. Then and, they and, gave it to a writer to polish yeah. it up, and then they got screen script writers to, to yeah. do the scripts. But but even that at the end, remember, Rogue One had a different ending, and that's yeah. why the trailers look different, and that's why in the version we got, everybody dies, and then there was another version where not everybody died. Well, you know, if it, if it means pumping these movies out a little slower, I I can live with that. If just yeah, Put I think the, they should just get the stories yeah. down, nail them down. Solo looked like they had a plan to keep everybody happy. Yeah. Keep well, that's one of the things I like read was that the were. script is really not that different. It was the direction that changed. Right. Like I mentioned before, the right. you know less ad libbing, mm-hmm. stick to the script. The details, the details were in there, and they were they were details that made the story work. They were details that made the characters work, and they were details that kept the the hardcore fans and, happy. And I'll say it and again: if you want to experiment, that's what you need. if you want to experiment with tone do it on standalones don't experiment with tone midway through a trilogy because it yeah. it derails it yep yeah so i guess overall we're pretty happy here i don't think i'm gonna have to do three shows about getting everybody's different opinions here because <laughs> i even think you know the overall opinion is this isn't split in half like it was with not not i'm not talking about just us i'm talking about in general people seem to be enjoying this film Here's something in a positive interesting note. too. I've noticed with like all the different like cinema scores and the Rotten Tomatoes stuff. Rotten Tomatoes, the audience score for Rotten Tomatoes is like a fifty percent, but it's because half the people on there that actually rated it didn't actually watch it, and they said it in their in the comments too. But the cinema score, they take it from people that actually watch the movie yeah. as they're leaving the theater. A minus. That's, that's very that's good. Not bad. They that's said, but they said it was because due to the, you know, that they heard that, you know, Lando was a pansexual character, yeah, and that, and um, just the, right? the, the robot, the, the robot thing? too. Yeah. They had a problem with the robot because, like, oh, it's social justice and all. Oh, well, yeah, too ma- too many so, references you know, to no, social but justice. But you know what? There's no point in even go- delving into that because it's why reward it with with conversation. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, it, and watch the movie. They're basically <laughs> sabotaging. Part of the reason I think they're losing money is because people are sabotaging these movies without even seeing it. Well, that's happened a lot in the past. I mean, yeah. I think part of the reason why Solo isn't making as much money right now is because it's in May and we literally had Avengers, then Deadpool, and now this. And they just barely made it to number... They're barely making it to number one this time. Well, I don't understand why they're now going back to winter. They should stay in winter. Because... It- if they were going to stay in winter, stay in winter. Is it was this? I don't know if this was an experiment I to bring it, it to summer, like it initially was supposed yeah. to be, or is it is it standalones are summers and trilogies are winters? Is that what they want to do? I don't. I have no clue. If they're going to satisfy us by wrapping up this trilogy in a decent, good way and somehow fixing certain things, then they can take all the time they like, according yes. to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they have a year and a half now because it's this is yeah. going to be like the longest we're, stretch. We're not going to get it until December. December of- of 2019. 19, 19. Yes, we have a year and a half. Yeah. Wow. A year and a half time. to that, a year and a half till Galaxy's <coughs> Edge at Disney World. Yeah, I that's, don't know. A, that's all going to be How hidden around the same it? time. How are we going to stand it? So definitely lots of Star Wars content down the line for us. And we are going to continue uh, with other Star Wars subjects. And I will obviously be exploring this a little deeper, you know, in different aspects, obviously with the merchandising and the books and all that stuff that's coming, you know, right around the corner. <laughs> All right, I hope you guys enjoy today's show. We did basically an entire show just on Solo alone. No pun intended, Solo alone. We try to go at this film in as many different directions as we can. We dug through all the different interesting aspects of the movie. And even though we are not going to have to have, you know, the crazy, crazy repetitive examination of other people's feelings on it as we did with the last film we will return to this topic in other 
manners, I'm sure, in the near future. Plus, we have other topics coming up that we are just dying to put out there. So on behalf of everyone here, including my wife, Kim, and son, Kyle, who contributed to today's show, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon here at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. So how'd you guys let me beat you on that? Come on. There's no liars in this game. Just players. The seat taken. Nobody's in the seat that I ain't taken from. So this is, uh, Sabak? Sabak. Sabak. Got it. You played before? A couple times, yeah. Captain Lindo Carazzi. On solo. Looks like you're uh, having a good day. I'm a lucky guy. Can I ask you a question, Captain Calrissian? Anything, Han. It's Han, but that's okay. I heard a uh, story about you. I was wondering if it's true. Everything you've heard about me is true. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. This broadcast is part of the IC Robots radio network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. <laughs>